Hi, my name is Jeff Petraka. I'm the curator of entomology here at the Long Island Aquarium's Butterfly and Insect Zoo. Thank you for joining us in our second episode of the Invertebrate Biology Series on DNA LC Live. Today's episode will focus on social behavior in insects and arachnids. And, you know, you may be wondering what I have in my hand here. These are actually emperor scorpions from our living collections at the Long Island Aquarium. I've had this, these little, little babies for about maybe two or three years now. And, uh, you know, before we talk about sociality, it's kind of an important question to ask, you know, what exactly is sociality? What counts as social behavior in insects and arachnids? And so we're, we'll learn that there's really a spectrum of sociality. So ranging everything, ranging from everything from solitary behavior, so basically insects and spiders that don't want anything to do with any others of their kind, all the way on up to advanced city-like colonies produced by ants and bees and termites so-called true social behavior or eusocial behavior. And there's all variations on, on that in between. So during this episode, we will go through this sociality spectrum, talking about the advantages and um, sort of trade-offs that come along with this strategy of living and learn how it has shaped the evolution of invertebrates. Okay, so before we take a look at some of the examples of sociality in insects and other arthropods, I wanted to go through this concept of sociality spectrum that I mentioned earlier. And so up on the board here, you can see that what I mean is we have this range of behaviors that fall into this spectrum of social behavior. And so at the far left, we have uh, truly solitary arthropods. So arthropods that exhibit essentially little social interaction with other individuals of the same species, little or no social interaction with other individuals of the same species. And that would um, obviously exclude things like courtship. Um, and then on the far right here, I have what is termed uh, truly social behavior. And truly social behavior is also known as you social behavior. That you means truly social. Um, and so this, this describes a high level of social interaction among individuals of the same species. Now, this whole range in between here has a bunch of different behaviors, and there's a, a lot of terminology out there that uh, scientists use to describe these different behaviors and, and what type of sociality a, an invertebrate might have. Um, but you know, it's really not that important to get that terminology down. What's important is to understand the behaviors and how they shape the evolution of sociality in arthropods. And so uh, collectively, we use the umbrella term to describe these sets of behaviors as subsocial. And that umbrella term, subsocial, uh, basically means below social or basically below being truly social. And it has some first uh, steps that I would play, some first behaviors that I would place closer to the solitary end of the spectrum here, such as aggregation. And that's basically just insects or whatever other invertebrates that will um, join together in groups like cockroaches, for example, might just associate with each other, uh, or some types of cockroaches, I should say, uh, but they really have no other social interaction with, with each other beyond that. Then we have things like food sharing develop, and food sharing basically means when an individual goes out and forages food, and then other individuals in that same aggregation might take advantage of that individual's hard work, and uh, they'll share the food that that one has brought back. And then we start seeing also parental care. Now, parental care, uh, there are different levels of parental care. Now, here I'm thinking more of like an indirect parental care. So there are, there are insects that will um, simply provide for their babies and make sure that they're happy and ready to go. And then after that, they'll, they'll let them go and let them grow up. And then there are uh, insects and arachnids that will straight up live with their babies and take care of them just like a mother bird would until they're mature. And so there are a, there's a range of parental care, but we do start seeing parental care developing even at the lower ends of the subsocial spectrum. But as we go up the spectrum, we start seeing some other behaviors develop, such as the division of labor. And this um, deals with things like cooperative nest building. So what I mean by division of labor is when individuals are living together in a colony, they might divide up and partition up the tasks of um, colony life. So for example, like cooperative nest building. So like if you're if a bunch of bugs live in a hole or something and they, they're digging a hole, like maybe some of them will, will dig, uh, will, will spend part of their time digging so that the others can also 
um, go deeper down into ground. And as we move further up the spectrum, we start seeing things like cooperative brood care, cooperative uh, uh, care of young. And so that's when individuals in a colony will work together to take care of the babies in that colony, whether or not they're their own babies or, uh, or not. And we also see the development of the reproductive division of labor. And reproductive division of labor is a little bit different than division of labor. It's a little more advanced. And basically in the reproductive division of labor, we have the establishment of morphological castes. So uh, individuals in a colony are so, um, it's been, this division of labor has been so entrenched that they've started to develop um, different morphological features that might help them to carry out that, that task a little bit better. Better. So think about like with ants, for example, you might have a large uh, big headed ant with giant jaws that would be a soldier ant, or and then a little ant that might be um, one of the, the ants that are responsible for taking care of the larva. Um, so that's what we mean by reproductive division of labor. Lastly, we have the overlapping of generations, and that simply just means that there are multiple different generations coexisting in the same colony. And so these traits are more characteristic of truly social uh, behavior, whereas these traits are more characteristic of subsocial and uh, leaning towards solitary behavior. So um, obviously these are all social behaviors, but um, they they definitely range over over this, this spectrum, and I like to again. There's a lot of different terminology out there, and I I kind of prefer this terminology. I like to think of that sort of low end, closer to solitary, as communal behavior. Communal behavior describes when uh, invertebrates might live in the same or occupy the same area as one another, which definitely confers some distinct advantages, and. Uh, and technically communal behavior describes when individuals will share the same nest, meaning that they will uh, literally all live in the same, uh, the same nest that was uh, collectively. Um, and then as we move, but again, they have no real interest in interacting with other beyond that. And then as we move up towards the eusocial end, we see cooperative or quasi-social behavior. And cooperative behavior describes uh, literally like, like taking care of um, one another's uh, juveniles or extended parental care. So basically, those th that's describing invertebrates that, or other uh, arthropods that would uh, spend quite a bit of time rearing their young up until adulthood, um, <clears throat> and so on. And so, what I wanted to do was go through some of our aquarium animals and see how, uh, and go over a couple different examples that would fall into each one of these different categories, just to learn a little bit about how it has uh, shaped the evolution of sociality in insects. So at the sort of low end of the sociality spectrum, we start off with so-called solitary behavior or solitary insects and arachnids. And I uh, can think of no better solitary or example of a solitary insect than a praying mantis. So right here I have uh, a, giant, a giant Asian mantis from Southeast Asia, from Malaysia. She looks very similar to mantises that you might find in the Northeast, but definitely not the same thing. She's known as Hierodula, and she is a vicious predator. She wants nothing to do with uh, other bugs, um, other mantises, etc. She just wants to eat them and get a nice, healthy meal. She actually is looking a little on the thin side um, for, for this species, so she definitely is, is pretty hungry. Now, if she encounter even another male of her species at this point, she may not even have any interest in mating with him. She might just simply eat him. And you guys may have heard that whole that old uh, sort of bug myth that praying mantises, well, first of all, there's two myths involving praying mantises. Number one, that they're illegal to kill in uh, the Northeast, which is definitely not true. That's a complete myth. Um, not that you should, though. There's nothing wrong with praying mantises. You shouldn't actually go out of your way to hurt them. But the other myth is that the female will always eat the male after reproduction, and that's not necessarily true. Um, it certainly happens often, but that's just because she's a vicious predator. She's solitary through and through. She doesn't want anything to do with others of her kind. She would rather eat them and get a nice, healthy meal. And especially after reproduction, you know, she's gotten what she needs out of the male. Why not just take him out, right? Free meal. So uh, she is definitely a good example of a solitary insect. Let's take a look at another example. When we talk about solitary insects and spiders, perhaps no example is better than the tarantula. 
So this is a Goliath bird eater, one of the largest tarantulas in the world. Specifically, this is Therophasa sturmi, the burgundy Goliath tarantula from South America. And right now, she is enjoying a cockroach, a big pepper roach that I gave her. So kind of like the pepper roach I showed you last time, in the last episode. Now, she is an angry spider. She really does not want anything to do with other spiders. She lives by herself. And in fact, male tarantulas, when they try to go out and find a female, depending on the species, uh, the range of aggressiveness varies. But usually, female uh, tarantulas are pretty aggressive towards males. And males are just as aggressive back. And so the male tries to go out and mate with a female. But he has to be extra careful, just to make sure that she doesn't decide to uh, take him out and kill him. Um, kind of like the praying mantis did earlier with her, with her male. This is a big spider, by the way. Just, she's a little, again, she's a little nasty, but I wanted to kind of show you. Let me see if I get my hand in here. And kind of see that she's almost, the, she's actually much bigger than my hand. Big spider, and she's not even done growing yet. We'll talk more about her in another episode, but for now, I just wanted to highlight her as a solitary arachnid. So for the most part, butterflies are essentially solitary creatures. They sort of live by themselves, they keep to themselves, they lay eggs, and they let their babies fend for themselves. So they don't really exhibit much in the way of social behavior other than mating behavior. However, this is one exception. So up here in our butterfly exhibit, we have some of our long-winged butterflies, uh, which roost in this one spot here uh, virtually every single night. And uh, this strategy is basically just an it's almost like essentially just aggregating together and sort of finding um, other butterflies to, to nestle down with for the night. Um, there's really no advantage to this other than the fact that they're sort of safe, more safe in, in numbers. Um, and these butterflies will do this, the long-winged butterflies, that is, will do this in the tropics as well. And uh, apparently they will... Uh, uh, the same butterflies will initiate the roosting site night after night, and um, other butterflies will follow suit and join up. And so you can often see these big clutches of butterflies, um, upwards of 20 to 30 individuals at a time. This does sort of form the basis of the next level of sociality, which would be termed sub-social behavior. So this concept of aggregating and, so and sort of forming uh, groups of individuals um, can be thought of as aggregation, and it's sort of the first vestiges of, of a true sort of social behavior in insects and other arthropods. So let's take a look at some insects that actually do undergo a little bit more of a, an official aggregatory behavior. So when it comes to aggregation, the idea when we talk about aggregation is simply that individuals will associate with each other, and that's pretty much it. They might do so for mating reasons, they might do so for... Um, you know, just because they happen to be near each other, but it presents some advantages. So the fact that there are always individuals of your species around you means that you will have access to mates in the future. And you'll also have protection because safety in numbers, you know, like the, the stick, the uh, bugs that you're associating with might get picked off by a predator before you will. And so stick insects are an example of this aggregation behavior where it's a little bit less let's say, socialized than that butterfly that we saw earlier that actually demonstrated parental care, but we still technically call it an aggregation. So this here is a Maclay's specter stick insect, also known as a spiny Australian stick insect. Here's the big girl right here. Sorry about the re reflection there. So she's, her, she's sort of blending in with the foliage there. Now these guys come from Southeast Asia and Australia. And there's a whole bunch of them in here. So if you sort of direct your attention up. There's another one in the background over there. Um, I've got one, I got a, a little girl, a, a newly emerged juvenile, a newly emerged adult female here. Um, over here, I have some babies. So right up at the top, you can see some juveniles, like quite juveniles, so like nearly hatchlings all the way up in the background right over there. And so these guys live together. And you know, if it were not for the fact that I put them all in this habitat together, they might not even associate with each other in the wild. But they do tolerate one another's presence. They live near each other. Now, they don't really have any interaction with each other. There's no division of labor. There's no parental care. There's none of that going on whatsoever. And so 
in fact, the moms are actually quite hands-off when it comes to child rearing. There's a, actually a male right up there. It's kind of cool. You can see the difference between the boy and the girl. So this is a girl right here. As you can see, her abdomen, her tail here is big and fat and filled with eggs. She drops them onto the forest floor. So down here, there's probably quite a few eggs in the soil down there. And they'll, they actually have like a little package of food on them, and they wind up getting picked up by ants. And if you look up at some of these hatchlings, let me see if I can zoom in on one of them a little bit more closely. Here's one right there, actually. Let's see if we can get a better shot of her. So there's a hatchling. That's quite a small stick bug. Notice, though, that it doesn't really look like the adult. She, this little hatchling has a dark body and a little orange head. She's actually losing her orange head at the moment, and she's got a little white stripe on her back. Now, the reason that the eggs had a little package of food on it is to attract ants. And the ants will pick up the egg with the package of food because they want to eat the food. They take the egg down into their colony. They feed on the, the package of food, and then they throw the egg in the garbage. For whatever reason, they don't want to really mess with this sick insect egg. But the egg... Uh, is then protected for the time it takes the egg to hatch. And the juvenile stick bug, when it hatches, will be able to, um, will essentially look like an ant to sneak out of the, out of the ant colony and then go up into the, the leaves where she will start her stick bug life. And then eventually she'll take on the coloration of um, the mother or the mother and the adult stick insect. So the mother is extremely hands off. She doesn't want anything to do with her baby. She really could care less. She has, she lays hundreds of eggs, upwards of a thousand, so she really has no interaction with the juvenile. There's no parental care involved, although it's an indirect parental care if you think about it by putting a package of food on the, uh, on the egg in order to uh, facilitate this symbiotic relationship with ants. That being said, let's take a look at an aggregatory insect that's taken uh, their aggre aggregation to a little bit of a, a different level. This butterfly takes aggregatory behavior to a new level. This is known as the great egg fly. And this is one of the few butterflies that demonstrates some level of parental care uh, as an adult. And parental care is one of the components of a subsocial behavior in insects and arachnids. So this butterfly will lay on the top of her eggs when, after she lays them and essentially protect them from things like parasites and uh, ants and, and things like that. And this technically qualifies as parental care, but that's the extent of parental, of subsocial behavior in butterflies really, other than the aggregatory behavior that we witnessed earlier. So we saw in the stick insects and the butterflies this basic aggregation behavior where individuals just sort of gather with each other. And, you know, it's just a gathering. There's really no um, division of labor or, or extended living, uh, uh, um, sort of combined living going on. But let's take a look at where, at how aggregation can be taken to new heights with our assassin bugs. So if we take a look at this log here, you will see several white spotted assassin bugs. And white spot assassin bugs are a type of what's called a rejuviate, an assassin bug. Uh, that's the family of assassin bugs. And when I say that word bug, um, a true bug actually means something to entomologists. A true bug is an insect with sucking mouth parts. So its mouth parts are designed for um, essentially piercing into either plants or animals, and obviously in this case animals. These guys are, are noshing on some crickets here. Um, and their mouth parts are not designed for chewing. So like if you think of a grasshopper or a caterpillar, they have chewing mouth parts that break up the leaves. Assassin bugs and other true bugs have piercing mouth parts. And so these guys spend time with each other. They live together and they, they all live in the same area. And they, uh, but they really mind their own business. They spread out from each other. They nestle into separate little cracks and crevices. But when it comes time to actually eating, they definitely engage in food sharing. So we can see this guy right here enjoying a cricket all to himself. However, up here on the side, I don't know if you guys can get a good, a good image of that. Right there, I have a nymph, that's this guy right here, and I have an adult right here, both enjoying the same cricket. So they're actually sharing food. This other guy's just sort of wandering <laughs> over top, they really don't have good manners, as you can see. 
But anyway, these guys are sharing food right now. And that highlights one of the advantages of this, of, of gathering with others of the same kind. You can do things like this. You can actually take part in sharing food. Uh, you can help take down food and then others can sort of reap the spoils of whatever it is that you were able to take out, whether if you're a predator that is. And, but, re but that's really the extent of social behavior in these assassin bugs. They don't really take care of their babies. They don't really care necessarily about their young. They lay their, their, their eggs in sand in sandy soil, and then they walk away, and that's the end of it. Um, but if we uh, think about how this sociality is evolving in the insect world, we are kind of moving on up a little bit, right? So we went from just gathering together to now gathering together and also sharing food. And let's take a look at the next step. So that would be the so-called communal behavior. And with communal behavior, we talk about insects or arthropods that will establish uh, themselves in the same nest or the same area and they'll take part in maybe digging holes or, or you know building a web or something like that with each other um, but it definitely is a little bit of a further step than these assassin bugs here so let's look at my favorite example in the spiders this is hands down one of my favorite spiders ever this is called a golden orb weaver nephila clavata clavipes rather um, more specifically, the giant golden orb weaver from Florida, southern Texas, and Central America. And she is a perfect example of a grouchy neighbor. And so when we talk about communal arthropods like spiders and wasps and things like that, uh, communal implies that they tolerate one another's presence, they might share the same nest, they share the same living quarters or living habita habitation, but they each have their own territory and they don't want to be bothered with other members of the community. Um, and the golden orb weaver is not the best example perhaps of communal um, behavior in spiders, but it's the only one that I physically have here at the moment. Um, my favorite example is actually Metapyra from Central and South America, but I don't have any of those. Uh, we'll take a look at those in a moment, but for now, what I wanted to show you is just this idea of uh, communal orb weavers. So uh, if you guys can make out here, here's the spider. So she's pretty big. As you can see, she's almost the size of my finger, definitely the size of the palm of my hand. And she's sitting in the middle of an orb web here. Now, interestingly, she did not build this orb web, but this one did. So she's up there in the corner. Let me see if I can get a good shot of her. There she is, chilling up there in the corner, like a dog with her tail between her legs, just because she, apparently these two guys duked it out last night. And the larger Nephila right here uh, scared that other spider out of her web. And she's definitely a little bit bigger and I believe a little bit older as well, but they're from the same clutch of eggs, interestingly. Um, so now, these guys are communal, meaning that they tolerate each other's presence, but they really, as you can see, don't like each other. So in fact, if um, with communal orb weavers, if they wander into each other's orb web, uh, often the, the owner of the orb web will fight the other, the, the intruder, and possibly even kill and eat the intruder. Um, so they really are not necessarily <laughs> best buddies or, you know, wanting to associate with each other. But they do like to live near each other. And the advantage of this, again, is just because they can, if they live near others of the same species, they can ensure that they're always going to have other individuals for both them and their offspring to reproduce with. They don't have to worry about finding mates necessarily. There's also other individuals around that might um, attract the attention of predators before she will. So in a, in a way, it's like a safety and number sort of idea where she can ensure that she will um, um, there are other individuals that might bear the brunt of a predator assault. And so, again, this is not my favorite example, but let's take a look at Metapyra, just because I think that um, highlights the idea of communal arthropods a little bit better. And we'll take a look at a few wasps as well. So here's that Metapyra spider that I was mentioning earlier. Now, Metapyra incrustata is the species I was mentioning that had... Um, that would, that would build these proper sort of communal orb webs uh, from Mexico and Central America. And the, what they'll do is they'll essentially uh, construct their webs um, separate from one another and in such a way that larger, older, healthier spiders wind up essentially building their webs at the center of this community. And the smaller spiders are uh, 
uh, forced and relegated to the edges and the periphery of the community. And uh, it's a pretty cool setup because ultimately what it winds up doing is it prevents the ability of parasitoid wasps from targeting those big, plump, healthy spiders at the center of their communal web, which is a good adaptation for uh, social living in the first place. Like I was mentioning earlier, safety in numbers is uh, um, pretty important, honestly. And so because there are so many different webs blocking these parasitoid wasps from entering the center of uh, a web mass, the larger, healthier spiders, the ones that the, the wasps might be more interested in taking down, uh, are gonna have a hard time getting in there to try to uh, grab those those wasps and drag them, or grab those uh, spiders rather, and drag them away. So they're going to be forced to eat the little babies at the ends. It's almost like the idea of selfish herd in a, um, a schooling fish community or a, um, a flocking bird community. So you've, I'm sure you guys have all seen the the um, a fish ball that's like in, in nature documentaries where like sharks or um, dolphins or whatever are trying to uh, eat the fish in a fishbowl and then they all wind up swimming together and pushing each other aside and, and basically forming this giant fluid um, uh, school of fish in order to escape predation. And that's kind of the same idea except with webs and spiders. Now I have a couple of other communal arthropods here as well. And so in the middle here, um, I have what is known as a cicada hawk. So if you guys have ever seen a cicada, uh, that's those things that make the loud noises in the summer um, uh, during the hottest parts of the day. And then this giant critter up here is a cicada hawk wasp. They're huge. And if you've ever seen them up in the Northeast, um, they may be very intimidating. And I'm sure they can give you a powerful sting, but they're pretty much harmless. If You have to try to get stung by one of these guys. So don't be afraid of them if you ever see them. Um, but these guys are specialists on taking out cicadas. Now, this female is attacking, actually a mating pair of cicadas here, and she's going to drag them back to her burrow. And she stings them, paralyzes them, and then she lays an egg on them and uh, the egg will hatch into a grub which will eat the cicada alive for the rest of its life. Pretty gruesome. Now these cicada hawks, while they're not technically communal, they're actually technically solitary, they do form aggregations, meaning that they live by themselves, they dig their own burrows, they will have you know four, five, six cicadas in a single burrow, uh, lay an egg on each one of them, but they might group their, 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 their uh, burrows together. And the advantage of this is the fact that you are going to have, uh, your babies are going to have um, other cicada hawks to reproduce with down the line. Matter of fact, actually, some of these, some wasp communities have demonstrated a, uh, a behavior known as protandry. And in protandry, basically males in a communal, in a group of communal uh, uh, wasp burrows, males will emerge first and or even bees rather, I should say, not just wasps. Males will emerge first and basically sit and wait or even duke it out and fight to the point where they'll wait for females to emerge and then the males with the best spot, the best sort of uh, spotting ability will be able to jump out and, and claim the best females as they emerge. And so clearly this, that type of, of aggregation and then ultimately leading to communal behavior um, as advantageous and, and at least for reproductive reasons. And so a truly communal arthropod that we would have in the Northeast would be a carpenter bee. Now, believe it or not, carpenter bees, you guys may have seen these guys before. Um, those, those are the big gigantic hovering bees <clears throat> that you'll see in the summers. And they dig little holes, actually chew little holes out of uh, wood and they dig little burrows. And there are actually sometimes as many as, as four or five um, carpenter bees in a single nest. Now, they're not technically interacting with each other, however. They do cooperate in terms of, um, they might cooperate in building a, a burrow. Uh, so like like one, one bee might chew a hole and then another bee will come in and chew another offshoot hole off of that. And, but they do, they kind of keep to themselves. Once they, once they uh, separate themselves out in a, in a, a burrow, um, they really don't have any interaction with each other, but they use the same entry and exit hole. And that's important because if you, if your nest is within a, in, in a tree and you only have one eg entry or exit, that means it's a lot easier to protect your babies from parasites and things like that that might be interested in coming in and taking out your babies or laying eggs on, baby, on your babies. So um, this is the, 
this is the, the epitome of what it means to be communal. And it's this concept of nest sharing and the benefits of it being mostly for reproductive reasons as well as for um, predator avoidance. But then after that, we move on up to what I had termed cooperative or uh, truly subsocial arthropods. And one of the first examples I wanted to use is one that I, I don't physically have. Um, they were a little small, so I can't really, uh, I don't really, wouldn't look good on the camera anyway. Um, but a lot of time, there are a lot of, of, in particular, bees that demonstrate this cooperative behavior. And one of my favorite examples is this little guy here. It's the small carpenter bee known as Serotina. And uh, this one is from Florida. It's a little tiny green bee, and you'll, you actually can see her sitting on the flowers. These are the anthers of, I believe it's, like I said in the picture, it was a, um, a puntia cactus. And they're collecting little pollen balls here. That's all those little yellow things on, the, on their legs. And she's taking it back to her nest. And so her, these guys make their nests in uh, like a cut branch. They'll actually go right up, they'll chew a hole here and then go right down deep into the branch. And um, they'll make little uh, baby cavities. And so this is actually supposed to be the overwintering, they call it a hibernaculum. Um, so basically one year, at the end of the year, they'll, they'll dig into a stem and then they'll, they'll chill here for the, for the winter until the following season. Um, but the, this is their, their actual nest. And so they might build four or five cavities in their nest. And the bee will basically walk between these cavities taking care of her young. And so um, she'll start by laying an egg down here, she'll load it up with pollen, then she'll go up and do another one here, then she'll go up and do another one here, and then she'll go up and do another one here, and then she'll stand guard and wait until her babies are, are safely uh, pupated. Um, and so this, this cooperative, so it's really just hers and necessarily other bees involved here, but um, this is a pretty high degree of parental care going on. And the benefit of parental care is that you can ensure the safety and the uh, health of, of your babies or as many babies as possible. So um, and it's actually been shown numerous times that when, uh, especially there are some bees that, there are some bees in particular that will sometimes be solitary, sometimes be social, sometimes be not social at all, et cetera. And uh, when they do demonstrate this cooperative social behavior, uh, the number of offspring and the health of their offspring definitely improves, but it comes at a cost to the bee herself. So she's unfortunately spending all her time taking care of her babies, um, spending a lot of time taking care of just these babies as well. So she may not be able to produce as many babies per se on her own, um, but she'll at least know that they're gonna be of a pretty high quality evolutionarily speaking. So let's take a look at an example of some of the cooperative arthropods that we have at the aquarium. Here at the Long Island Aquarium, I think perhaps one of my favorite examples are these little guys. These are called heterometris, or Asian forest scorpions. And this is a small colony that I've had here for several years now. And as you can see, uh, I have a great big female there. Now she is the mom of this colony here. Uh, she's been taking care of these babies for as long as we've had them, honestly. I believe they are her babies, actually. Um, let me see if I can focus on her a little bit better there. There we go. All right, so I can see that I have a big female here, and then I have a bunch of little juveniles here. Now, these guys, believe it or not, I'm saying they're babies, but they're actually a little bit uh, younger, uh, a little bit older than that. They're not quite babies anymore. They're almost two years old now. Um, and I'm, as you can see, I'm pulling my hand away, sort of, but uh, I'm not really afraid of these guys, per se. They're not a dangerous species of scorpion. I'd just rather not get stung. Um, but the reason that these guys are cooperative is because they will engage in, um, their, their little colony will engage in cooperative nest building. They will uh, divide the labor. So that's, again, one of the characteristics of subsocial behavior, a division of labor within the colony. And the juveniles will go off and dig little holes and make the nest a little bit bigger in the wild, of course. Here at the aquarium, they sort of sit out on the top of the soil, and I give them a little piece of log here uh, to rest on. So that's their little home here. <laughs> she got freaked out a little bit there. You can see the little babies. They're very fat and, and uh, chubby. Um, but they'll engage in cooperative nest building, meaning that the babies will help mom build nests, build a nest. And they'll also um, 
share food with one another, and the mother has been observed um, actually pre-masticating, so chewing food, pre-chewing food, and giving it, regurgitating it to her babies. Um, again, just like a mother bird. So this sort of subsocial behavior is one of the most advanced in, uh, in terms of the sociality spectrum that we mentioned earlier. And so when we have this division of labor, we have the aggregation behavior, um, those factors uh, will contribute to us calling this subsocial behavior. So scorpions are, are cool and all. There are many, many insects and bees uh, that engage in this subsocial behavior. Uh, so let's talk about a few of those. So we saw how our heterometrous Asian forest scorpions cooperate to or form subsocial little groups where they cooperate to take care of one another's young and their own young. And they divide the labor in terms of digging burrows and, and so forth. And that leads me into another insect group that demonstrates a, um, the same type of social behavior. That is the cockroaches. Now cockroaches, as I said in last episode, the last episode, that they are very undersold insects. A lot of people really don't like them. They think they're um, gross or whatever. And again, of the 4,600 species of cockroaches out there, very few of them are considered pests to humans. This one, for instance, is actually a very common pet, scorp uh, pet um, cockroach. This is the so-called Madagascan hissing cockroach from Madagascar in southern Africa. And this colony has I have countless individuals in it. I don't even know how many are in here, probably well over uh, 300. And on this log here, we can see multiple different individuals. We have females. There's a big gigantic female right here. There are juveniles interspersed amongst the little grains of wood. And there is a few, there are actually a couple males. So this is a male here. And you can tell he's a male. He's a very small male. But you can tell he's a male by the little humps on his back. And so when we talk about uh, cooperative behavior as a form of subsocial, subsociality in insects, just like the scorpions, these Madagascan hissing roaches will form little colonies where there's usually one male or a small number of males and, uh, who, who forms a family unit with a bunch of females as well. And they all work together to, to take care of each other's offspring. They divide up the labor in terms of digging burrows and things like that, which is what they would, where they would normally be in the wild, um, in rotting logs or in uh, um, earthen burrows. And in so doing, they can raise many more offspring much more successfully. So this type of simple society helps them to maximize the number of offspring that they can rear. They can rear. Now, when it comes to cockroaches, they do have interesting levels of parental care as well as this cooperative subsocial behavior, depending on the species of cockroach that you're talking about. However, uh, my favorite example of sociality is the most, is the highest level of sociality, that is the eusocial level of our sociality spectrum. And in this level, we have things like ants, bees, and uh, termites that take social behavior to new heights. And so let's start off by looking at one of our leafcutter ant colonies here at the Long Island Aquarium just to see how eusociality differs from subsocial behavior. Ants are one of the most diverse groups of eusocial insects. Ants are actually all part of a single family of insects called the Formicidae. There are about nearly 13,000 species of ants out there. Here at the Long Island Aquarium, we don't really have many species of ants, um, but we do have some of the most popular in terms of uh, exhibit organisms or organisms that the public might want to watch. And these guys are known as leafcutter ants. And so I'm trying to get a good shot of these guys eat, carrying leaves and cutting leaves here. I don't have good enough camera equipment to get them much better than this. But uh, you can see how, there he is. This little ant here is carrying a leaf that he just cut off of the food plant that he's sitting on. Now, this is a common shrub called Euonymus. And uh, we actually have to feed these guys throughout the year. Let me see if I can get him in focus a little bit better. There he is. So he is now carrying that leaf, that leaf cutting, back to his colony. I don't know what he's doing, though. He's walking back and forth, and he's a little confused here, I think. 
And it's pretty amazing, though, that these leaf cuttings are, are many, many times the weight of the ant itself. So he's able to, or she, rather, is able to lift that leaf cutting over the top of her head and carry it around like it's nothing. There he goes, finally. Now he's on the, he's on the, she's on the right trail. So there she goes. So let's see where she's bringing that leaf cutting. She's walking all the way down the plant. So that little leaf cutter ant brought her leaf cutting down underground to one of these areas. And this is really the major underground constituent, or component rather, of a leaf cutter colony. So what you're seeing is an actual garden chamber of one of our leafcutter colonies. So believe it or not, all of this gray material, sort of crevicey and crater looking, all of that material are uh, leaves, leaf cuttings. You could actually see the ants incorporating new pieces of leaf. There's one right there that the ants are incorporating into the, the comb, into the uh, garden rather. There's another one down there. And so all of these little crevices represent leaves that have been incorporated into the garden and the ants will allow their symbiotic fungus to grow up and over that leaf cutting and it will be incorporated into this garden complex. So essentially the leaf cutter ants are farmers. So they don't actually directly feed on the leaf themselves itself, they feed on the fungus that grows on the leaf and that those leaves, or that fungus rather, needs um, fresh leaf material and plant material on which to grow. This is pretty cool to watch. It's mesmerizing actually. You could stand here and stare at this for quite some time. You can witness all kinds of very interesting behaviors. But this is the epitome of eusociality in insects. So these guys have literally developed these gigantic networks of gardens. Now in the wild, an old mature leafcutter colony might contain as much garden material that would occupy a three-story house. That's insane. That's a huge amount of space. Uh, now, you know, you, if you watch the ants, you can witness all other kinds of behaviors. But, the, you know, this is essentially a, a kind of like a human city in many ways. So each one of these ants, you know, they look like they're just sort of milling around and chilling. And a lot of them, I guess a lot of them are. But most of them are hard at work and they have a task at hand. And so deep within this network of garden of fungus, uh, there are ant larvae and pupa. And that's the whole idea. The reason that they're growing their food like this is so that they can grow, uh, grow ant larvae to produce new individuals. And then one queen is responsible for all of this, by the way. So this garden is one of many for this particular colony. This garden, this, ant, this colony actually comes from Paraguay, um, from my friends at the Toledo Zoo, actually, in Ohio. And notice that you know, there's a lot going on here, and you can see different sizes of ants. So there are uh, big ones, there are little ones, there are medium-sized ones. You can see a big one um, fumbling around on the bottom over there. There's a huge one. And each of these different size ants, it's all the same species, but they just are morphologically different. That means they look physically different from one another. And that's because they're designed for different functions. This is known as the reproductive division of labor. So basically, this entomologists call this a caste system, and each morphological caste has a different responsibility. So let's take a look at some of those castes just to get a better idea of what they look like. Let's check them out in the foraging chamber above just because it's a little bit easier to see. So this is a different angle of one of our foraging chambers. This is a behind the scenes chamber. It's a little messy, so bear with me here. But we can see the ants a little bit better up here. So notice I have more euonymus in here for the ants to uh, cut and take back to their, their, their colony. We can see some ants here carrying leaves. And notice there are different size variations of ants. So here, this big gigantic guy right here is known as a soldier or a maximum. Maxima are the largest cast of leafcutter ants. And the maxima, uh, their role is essentially to serve as... Um, 
um, guards for the foraging ants. So as ants leave the colony, the safety of the underground, these soldiers have gigantic jaws which are designed to um, attack, pierce, and cut into uh, potential threats to the leafcutter ants. These are actually relatively small soldiers. Let's see if I could get a better, better image of one of them here. Maybe not. They're a little too small for this camera, unfortunately. But that's okay. You guys get the idea, I think. The next size are these uh, leaf cutters here. You can see that those are sort of a medium-sized ant. So let's take a look at this guy right here that's carrying the leaf. You can see him sort of wandering. There he is. Oh man, look at that guy. He's carrying a huge leaf. Go for it, buddy. You can do it. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing to see. Check that out. So notice that these guys are sort of medium-sized ants, and they are actually called media or medium, singular. The media are responsible primarily as the brunt force leafcutter ants. They're the ones that are being turned out to go out into the rainforest and collect foliage from plants. And remember, I said earlier that uh, a single leafcutter colony can grow to be the size of a three a three-story house underground. That's insane. That's a huge amount of space. So it turns out that leafcutter ants are so ecologically important that they can defoliate up to 17% of the surrounding far foliage in a rainforest. That's incredible. And if you guys know anything about rainforest ecology, you'll know that the rainforest has this dense thicket or canopy over the forest floor. So much, it's so thick, in fact, that plant, that light can't really penetrate it. And as it turns out, when leafcutter ants defoliate trees, they allow sunlight to penetrate that deep thicket of canopy, and the light will hit the forest floor, where it will allow seeds that have been laying dormant for years and years and years, sometimes 30, 40 years, to germinate and race to reoccupy that defoliated spot in the canopy. They're basically, these plants are competing for light. So leafcutter ants in their own way are almost like nature's gardeners. They're like the pruners that are taking care of um, uh, trimming in the rainforest. Yeah, check it out. Look at that guy carrying that giant leaf. What a champ. You know, it always amazes me to see these guys doing such incredible lifting. And there's that soldier again. Now, just to kind of uh, show you how damaging soldiers can be, notice that I put my hand in there for a second and they're already going up on me, biting me. Now, soldiers can actually bite down with quite a bit of force. They actually will cut right into your skin and leave behind a, a little red razor mark. He didn't actually get me in a good angle, but usually they're getting me right in my cuticle or something like that, and it's, it's, it's very, very irritating. Um, now, notice actually how just my presence has really, really freaked them out a little bit. They're all going crazy now. And it turns out that ants, like other social insects, have what are called alarm pheromones. Um, uh, that will be released that the other ants can detect uh, when there's a threat present and all of them will kind of go into fight or flight mode and they'll all start trying to attack that, that potential threat. So uh, anyway, I mentioned the maximum, the medium, and then the only other cast that I did not mention are the minima. Those are the smallest ants. And you can see a couple of them wandering around in here, but there's not that many of them. That's because those guys are primarily the gardeners. So actually, in some part, both, so, are, so are the, uh, the, the media. But the minima really enjoy taking care of the garden. So let's see if we can see some of those minima here. In this fungus chamber, I can see little tiny ants. You can actually see them right up here. There's a little baby one right there. Look how tiny those are. Those are minima. And one of the primary functions of the minima are to serve as the gardeners. They're the ones who are taking the leaf cuttings and cutting into them and their saliva, along actually with the, the media to some extent, their saliva actually contains chemicals that promote the growth of their own fungus 
and inhibit the growth of other fungus and other microorganisms. So believe it or not, it's almost like they're, they're using chemical fertilizer and pesticides on their fungal crop, kind of like a human farm would, which is pretty incredible. You can also see right here a chrysalis or a pupa of what appears to be a soldier ant. It's a pretty big um, pupa, that's why I say that. I don't see any larva though. I mean, you can see, there you go. There's a little white mass right there. Those are all chrysalises and, um, or pupa rather, and larval ants. And basically a larval ant looks just like a, like a booger. It really doesn't look like much, so you're not missing anything if you don't see one. There's some more larva there. Um, you can actually see ants here carrying some eggs. Those are new, new, newly, or, or soon to be hatched larval ants. And so the minima can, are small enough that they can go back and forth in between those little holes in the fungus. And when they do that, they pack their larva deep inside the fungus. So that's why these guys need so many leaves. You can see them going nuts here with the leaves. So this tube is leading from my foraging chamber here. You can sort of see them uh, carrying those leaves here. Let me get a little bit darker. You can see them carrying those leaves from the foraging chamber down into the fungus chambers. A little bit of a traffic jam going on there. <laughs> but notice that the, minim that the media are always the ones carrying the leaves for the most part. So this society is governed by a single queen. And this one queen can lay can live for about 17 to 25 years, believe it or not. Each individual worker might only last for at most like a year and a half or so, but they're essentially expendable. The queen is really the meat and potatoes in terms of the genetic stock controlling this, this entire colony here. Now this, this garden, this uh, leaf cutter colony extends probably about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 garden boxes. I have some large garden chambers up top. So this is a pretty decently sized colony. So let's take a closer look at some of these casts, just so you guys can see them a little bit better. I know it's kind of difficult here. So here are the leaf cutter casts that I showed you earlier, but this is just a little bit of a better image to give you a better idea of what they look like. And so we see the minimum here, we see the medium workers here, we see the maximum here, and then we have a queen and a drone, which I did not show you earlier. It's pretty cool, you can see how these guys are quite a bit larger than the rest of the workers. Um, the other thing that this picture highlights is the fact that there's variation or polymorphism in, within each of the different worker casts. Uh, so you can see that so the media workers here um, are all various different sizes. And this actually might even be a soldier here, technically. Um, but the point is that there's variation within each of the different worker casts. There is variation. And so that highlights the way that these individuals even come to develop in the first place. And so um, these are all the same organism. Remember? They all have the same genetic program. But the way in which their genes are being expressed likely varies. So it's thought that when a larva is developing in a leaf cutter garden, the workers that are taking care of those larvae can actually um, alter the care that they're giving those larvae so that they develop into each, to either a minimum, a medium, or a maximum. And uh, that might be things like you know, the level of feeding that they're giving them or the time it takes them to develop into a, a worker. Uh, to go their life cycle to develop into a pupa rather um, and essentially alteration of these environmental factors will uh, change the genetic will change the uh, epigenetic uh, elements such as methylation that regulate various genetic elements of the uh, body plan uh, genes for these workers for these developing larvae so essentially um, changing the environment will activate either a minimum body plan development or a uh, medium body plan development or a maximum body plan development or a queen body plan development. Drones, as we will talk about in a little bit, are actually haploid. So ants, bees, and termites 
uh, demonstrate what's known as haplodiploidy. So when a, a female, when a queen lays a single unfertilized egg, a haploid egg, it will develop into a male if it survives. But we'll talk about that momentarily. So this is pretty neat, but let's take a look at some of the other uh, variation or cast variation in other species of ants. So here we have one of my favorite ants. This is the army ant from South America. This is known as Eseton virtuli. And uh, these guys, you can see the gigantic soldiers right here. Very intimidating looking. Here we have a bunch of little workers. And unlike the leaf cutter ants, these guys are not quite as friendly. They are um, quite aggressive and they are predatory. So they'll go after um, other animals, so usually invertebrates, but sometimes even invertebrates. And like true army ants, they don't actually have a single sedentary colony. They actually move around quite a bit. And so they move up and move the entire colony from one place to another. And they literally make a ball of ants out of workers just to keep the brood, the larvae, safe within the uh, depths of the colony. Um, so the but then these guys, on the other hand, these are called honeypot ants. And honeypot ants come from the southwestern United States as well as Central America. And honeypot ants live in desert regions. And the, there's not a lot of variation among the different workers. Like they, they might be with different sizes and things like that. But one of the most obvious differences is in these guys here. These are known as repletes. And repletes are workers that have these gigantic balloon-like abdomens filled with uh, sugars and other nutrients to serve as literally honey pots or honey stores. And so because they live in desert regions, you know, these ants are omnivorous, so they'll go out onto the desert floor looking for um, fruit and plant material and, and other and, uh, uh, animal, dead animals and things like that. They might even take out small insects. And uh, but if they can't go out and forage because it's too hot or there's not enough food out there, they have these honey pots, these replete workers that store nutrients for the ants so that they can survive during those time periods. Pretty neat. These are pretty, pretty alien, actually. And so uh, ants aren't the only ones that do that have this eusocial lifestyle, though. So termites are another one of my favorite examples. And here is a perfect image of when I think of termite mounds. This is exactly what I think about. So this is probably a macro termite termite's mound in Africa, and you can see the size of this mound next to the, the lady the lady standing over here. So this is probably like you know, thirteen feet, fourteen feet tall, and or, or larger even. And so this mound is all above ground. And this is all, a lot of this is empty space, really. Um, we can actually see that if we cut into the side of this colony, we might see something like this. So it's pretty intricate and pretty complicated. I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about this here, but basically these ants grow fungus just like the leafcutter ants, except they're growing it in the savanna of Africa, or sometimes you can find mounds like this even in Australia and South American deserty regions. And they, the whole purpose of this is simply to provide uh, thermodynamic, um, as to essentially cool and or regulate the temperature inside of this, of this colony to provide the optimum temperature for the fungus to grow. And so the fungus, I believe, grows up in these little sort of trenches over here. Um, and then down here would be all the workers and all the nymphs, the brood, and the uh, queen would hang out down here as well. I think that's actually the queen in the image here. And so, um, but just like in the ants, we see there's a variation in different uh, body forms for each of the different termites in the colony. So we can see soldiers here. These are bigger individuals that are probably there for defense. We can see little uh, regular medium workers here, which are probably just the foragers. They might go out and collect um, uh, wood and other plant material on which to cultivate their fungus. And here we have a giant queen, and she's the most noticeable of all of the different casts. She looks like a giant sausage. This could be she could be as large as six inches in size, and she's essentially a gigantic sack of eggs. So there's her head there, there's her thorax, and there's her abdomen. So she's huge. And she's kind of like the monster from the Aliens movie, if you've ever seen that, the uh, Alien Queen. Um, now, uh, bees are, I think, the last example of this eusocial 
behavior. And this is just the honeybee um, right here, the regular Western honeybee that I think most people are familiar with. Uh, but there are many other types of bees that are also eusocial as well. So technically bumblebees, even yellow jackets to some extent are that demonstrate primitive eusociality. Um, and there are other types of bees that are eusocial as well, but the honeybee is one of the most familiar. And I'm gonna show you some actual bees momentarily, but I wanted to kind of point out that the, they have such a unique blend of demonstrating social behavior, interaction with each other. Um, they have these, they build these amazing hive structures, and they also produce and uh, manufacture um, brood and honey. In a, in a way that's just, it's just so unique for you social insects. And so each of these different cells that they, that you, you're probably used to seeing in a honeycomb is designed to either store honey or uh, pollen or even for the queen to lay an egg. And, uh, and, and a single, when the, in, a, in a brood cell, an egg will hatch into a larva that the workers will feed and nourish until it eventually will make a cocoon or a, crip or a pupa inside of the brood cell and ever emerge into a worker. Um, but whether we're talking about, you know, termites, bees, uh, ants, whatever, uh, haplodiploid is a commonality among all of them. And so when we talk about a hive that, or a nest or a colony that has a single queen, which by the way, they don't always just have one queen. Oftentimes, some, many ant species or bee species will have multiple queens, uh, but that's not for discussion now. But in a single, with a, in a single queen, uh, regulated colony. It's been suggested that haplodiploidy plays a role in how eusociality has even, has even uh, why eusociality has developed in the first place. And so the evolutionary biologist William Hamilton originally suggested this when he was talking about kin selection. Basically, um, he's saying that the more closely related you are, um, the more likely that you're going to try to um, demonstrate cooperative behaviors towards that other towards that other individual to a closely related individual. Um, so normally during sexual reproduction, we are, like if you think about humans, for example, um, relative to our brothers and our sisters, we're about 50% related to them. So we're, we're related to each other by a factor of about a half. So let's take a look at how bees do it though. So if we start with a diploid female bee, so here's like a, let's imagine this as being a queen. She will lay eggs. Okay, and those eggs are obviously haploid, right? Without being fertilized by another, by a sperm cell or by another egg cell, they're going to be uh, haploid. And when she lays um, unfertilized eggs, they will develop into haploid male bees. Notice the factor of relatedness here. These guys are related to this female by a factor of 100% because they're haploid, right? They're related to one another by a factor of 100% as well. Actually, they're, they're related to one another by a factor of about a half. But now let's take a look over here as we, we look at the sexual reproduction of a female bee and a male bee. So when these two guys get together, um, they, fertilize, they produce fertilized eggs that are diploid, meaning they have the full complement of chromosomes. And what winds up happening is because this guy only has genetic information from a female bee, right? He's haploid, remember, right? He will, when the when the the workers uh, are formed and developed, they're actually going to wind up being related to one another by a factor of three fourths. They're going to be seventy five percent related to one another. They're actually only going to be about fifty percent related to their mom. Interestingly, so this is in distinct contrast to a um, like a human reproductive system where we you know where we're related to one to our brothers and sisters by a factor of about a half. So. These guys are much more closely related than other organisms would be to their own to their brethren, and so because of of uh, this this uh, evolutionary biologist Hamilton, who they eventually have coined the term Hamilton's rule, it's been suggested that because these guys are so closely related, they're much more likely to take care of her the queen's eggs because they're very much they're cl more closely related to her, her eggs than they are to the queen herself. And so they're going to be. They're going to be. It's within their. It's in their best interest to take care of those eggs, because they can maximize the number of offspring that they can all produce as a single colony. Pretty cool. So let's take a look at some of our bees. 
just about everyone is familiar with the honeybee. They go out and collect nectar, pollen, and other plant material, as we discussed, and they bring it back to their hives in order to nourish their young and produce as many babies as possible. Now, each hive is only maintained, genetically speaking, by a single queen. And so uh, I'm here at the Long Island Aquarium's beehives. We actually have uh, three hives on the property here. They will be part of our new bee habitat in our butterfly exhibit this coming uh, year. And I wanted to show you guys exactly what their honeycombs look like. So this is a honeycomb. This is actually a standard frame that beekeepers use. And uh, you can see here all of these little tiny cells. Each of these cells is designed by the bees, actually produced by the bees, um, by mixing saliva and other plant resins, and they sort of regurgitate this comb. And each one of these cells is designed to hold um, either a larva or honey or um, other uh, plant material. And you can even see, I don't know if you guys can tell, there's like little yellow speckles here. Those are little uh, pollen balls that have been collected from previous years. And by the way, the darker the comb, the older it is. So this is uh, older, this is lighter up here. So that's much younger. Now, <clears throat> we take these combs, or these frames rather, and we put them in these bee boxes. I'll give you a up close and personal look at what these hives look like. So. It's getting kind of late in the day here, and uh, you can see this little holes in the bottoms of the hives here. That's where the bees are coming and going. So if we take a look at this hive, I can see a bee trying to land right now. There's another one that just came out. And there's one that is going into the hive right now. Um, you can see well, some of these guys are coming back empty handy, but handed, but usually they come back with little yellow um, like thighs, and those little yellow balls on their thighs are pollen that the bees have gone out and collected. Again, this is not the best time to be doing this just because it's a little late in the day. It's kind of cold still. Um, bees really aren't going to be, the bees are really going to be that active until summer when the temperatures start in, uh, increasing. But let's take a look inside one of these boxes. So now in the wild, a beehive would be located uh, in a, a tree, like a, a rotten log or something like that, and uh, they wouldn't be located in these boxes here. These boxes, the whole purpose of these is just so that beekeepers can keep better tabs on their bees and uh, produce honey. That's one of the products that we humans are very interested in extracting from the bees. So there you have it. Check that out. So all of these bees are hard at work producing um, more comb in order to house larva. And the queen is going around and laying eggs in each one of the cells that I showed you earlier. And the workers are busy going out and collecting nectar and pollen in order to feed to those larvae and make them big and healthy. So this strategy, as you can see, is pretty effective. This sort of division of labor that we discussed and um, dividing up the responsibilities of the hive have allowed a single queen to produce this many workers in a very short period of time. Now, by the middle of summer, this hive can be one or uh, can, be, uh, can um, be multiple boxes high, and it will be loaded with larva, honey, and bees. So pretty neat. You can even see them actually building some of the comb right here. Obviously they don't always they don't always build the comb where you want them to. Where is that piece of comb? There it is. Many people, by the way, are afraid of bees um, for good reason. I suppose people can be allergic to them. Uh, however, as you can see, these guys are pretty docile. They're very gentle little, little animals. They really are not interested in messing with me. 
And as long as I respect their space and I don't go uh, busting up their hive, they're not going to mess with me. Right here, where is it? Right there, by the way. I don't know if you guys can, can tell, but there is a newly molted adult bee, that lighter colored one right there. The lighter colored bees are the ones that are usually more, uh, more uh, fresher, just came out of their cocoons. But yeah, let's leave these guys to it. I don't wanna mess with them too much. Well, I hope today's episode of our invertebrate biology series has shown you the different degrees to which social behavior can exist in the insect and arthropod worlds. And I hope that you've also gained a new perspective on what it's like to live in a social arthropod society. After all, it, many of the behaviors that we saw today were behaviors that humans demonstrate in their families and, our, and their societies. We finished off our discussion of sociality with a discussion of the truly social or the eusocial insects. And I think it was pretty clear that one of the commonalities between many of those social insect societies uh, were plants. And next week's episode, we will discuss the plant and insect interactions that help to allow some of these societies to come about and how the evolution of insects has driven the evolution of plants flowering plants in particular, and vice versa. Hope to see you there. Don't forget to join us next week on DNA LC Live, and don't forget to follow us on our Twitter at DNA LC and our Instagram at DNA underscore learning underscore center.